So welcome to the course on human rights in Southeast Asia. My name is Dr. Mike Hayes and I'm from the Institute for Human Rights and Peace Studies at Mahiron University. In this first class we're going to have an introduction to human rights and we're going to talk about some of the fundamental concepts and ideas of human rights. In particular we'll look at what human rights means, where human rights come from and what human rights that we have. So we'll start off with the question, well what do human rights mean? What are human rights? Now the answer to that question is there's an easy answer and there's a difficult answer. The easy answer is that human rights are rights that we just have by the mere fact of being human. Because you're human, these are the things which you deserve, the things which you should have, and things which you should be free from. And that's just because you're a human. And the more difficult um, answer to that question is that we get these human rights because there's an internationally agreed standard between states, which is a, a political and a legal agreement between states that's legally binding that all people and countries have to be treated to this level, they have to be treated this way. So this is a more political and legal context to that answer. Now whether we take the more complex answer or the more simple answer, it still means that people have human rights. Now human rights are a special type of rights, they're different than other rights. And there's a few features about human rights which make them different. The first thing is that we talk about human rights being inherent, that means that everyone always already has human rights. We get human rights from the moment we're born. We don't have to know about those human rights. It doesn't depend on where we're born. It doesn't depend on our language. It doesn't depend on our education. It doesn't even depend on if we know about human rights, that those human rights are inherent to us. Now that's different from many other types of rights because other types of rights depend on, say, if you're a consumer and you get consumer rights, you have to buy something. If you're a student, to get student rights, you have to become a student somewhere. So all those depend on earning something or being something or doing something. Human rights doesn't need that. You already have human rights. You don't have to earn it in any way. The next feature which makes human rights different is that we say that human rights are inalienable. If you have human rights, you can't lose them. You always have those human rights. This has a couple of important implications. One is that states can't take away human rights. No matter, no matter how bad you are, you could be the most evil person in the world, the states can't take away your human rights. You're still treated as a human. Also, states just can't decide that this group of people don't have human rights because of your ethnicity or your language, or maybe not your, you're maybe not a citizen. That doesn't matter. You always have those human rights that are inalienable. Now, often a question to that is, well, what about prisoners or people locked up in mental institutions? Don't they lose their human rights? Now in that case, they may lose some rights, but they don't lose their human rights. Those people are still humans and they should get their basic human rights. A prisoner may lose the rights of freedom of movement. In some places they may lose the right to vote. They may lose some of their rights, but they don't lose their human rights. They still should be treated as a human. Another important concept of human rights is universality. What this means is that human rights exist everywhere. You could be in the middle of the ocean, you could be in no matter what country, you could even be on the moon, that you still have human rights because you're a human. Now this means that no country can deny human rights. No country can say we're not part of this human rights system because they're universal. Now one important part of that is that by being universal doesn't mean that everyone has identical human rights. Human rights are going to be slightly different between people. Men and women have slightly different rights. We have children's rights, so children have different rights than adults. And even between countries there are slightly different definitions of human rights. Now this doesn't mean that people miss out on human rights, it just means that the rights you have in Thailand are going to be slightly different to the rights you have in Malaysia, slightly different to the rights you have in the Philippines. But basically the kind of fundamental backbone of human rights does exist in all countries. So another important question is why do we have human rights? We have human rights because throughout history there have been people who have been mistreated and abused because of maybe their gender or their ethnicity or their age or the language they speak. Before, when states had sovereign power, they had the power to do whatever they wanted to people in their country. That could mean that they could you know, kill off certain parts of the population. They could treat different types of people differently because of their ethnicity or their gender. Now, what was realised that states should have a basic level of how they treat people. Around the world, states don't have the right to mistreat people just because of the colour of their skin or their gender or their age. 
there should be a basic level in which all people are treated. And that was the agreement that was made in 1948 about what human rights are and what they mean. But let's now turn to some other people's viewpoints about what human rights are, and we'll look at that in the next section. So the simple answer is that human rights are the rights of all humans. They're the same uh, for everyone. Uh, everyone is born with them. Uh, they don't, you don't lose your human rights. Um, the more complex answer is that human rights are political. Uh, they're uh, the rules of governments. They're the reason we have governments in the first place. Governments and states are there to protect human rights. That's kind of their sole reason for existing. Uh, and then you have the idea that Human rights are legal entitlements uh, that people can take to courts uh, to, to actually realize and, and exercise their rights. Uh, you also have the, the broader uh, notion that human rights are an idea. So an idea that we're all equally human, uh, we're all free, we're all uh, deserving of the same level of treatment, the same level of protection, the same level of kind of accountability. Human rights are rights, uh, belong to us. We are all equally entitled to, uh, without any discrimination or without any reference to our nationality, ethnicity, color, language, religion, whatever status we are uh, belonging to. It is um, rights that we all hold very dear to us. So next, let's look at where human rights come from. There's still some debate about the origins of human rights. Some people say, well, human rights can be found in religion and traditional cultures, because in these religions there are protection of the right to life and various um, protections of the family. But the problem with that view is that that's often a protection for people within the religion. It's not universal. Some other people also say, well, human rights emerged from the Enlightenment in Western Europe and North America around the 1600s and 1700s, where you see various declarations and bills of rights appearing and various people arguing that people should have human rights. But once again, these rights weren't universal. These were rights for just for people in that state. And often it wasn't recognising all people in the state. So slaves may have not had that right. Women may have not had the same rights of men. When we, the modern era of human rights, we tend to look at that emerging from a, a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this comes out in 1948, it's adopted by the United Nations. Now the reason the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out was because of a, a couple of reasons. One is that during World War II, the kind of atrocities that went on, the genocide in Europe and the mistreatment of people in the, in the Pacific War, that they realise that states need to have limits to their power. States need to have certain rules and regulations about how they treat people. States don't have the right to treat people however they want. It also came at a time where there's a new level of global governance through the United Nations, where people thought that we can, we have the ability now to enforce this universal level of human rights. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is an important document. In a sense, it's the backbone. When it was written in 1948, it involved people from around the world. There were people from Latin America and Europe and Africa and Asia, all involved in the drafting, and they wanted to make this document seem as universal as possible. And so the, the rights inside the Universal Declaration are seen to be you know, are recognised as rights around the world. Now, one important um, uh, limit to that is that it's seen that the Universal Declaration is just a declaration. It's not legally binding. Now, while that's true, that it's just a declaration, that if a state is going to join the United Nations, they have to agree that their definition of human rights is a universal declaration of human rights. Further, many of the rights inside the universal declaration of human rights are seen to be rights no matter what, that you have to obey these rights. The right to life and freedom of slavery and freedom from torture are going to be rights all the time. So it's our turn and look in more detail about what rights are inside the universal declaration of human rights. The universal declaration of human rights, which we will call from now the UDHR, List a number of rights which appear in human rights treaties after the UDHR. The rights can be categorized into groups, and we are going to describe some of these categories. The first category is fundamental rights, and though sometimes they are called peremptory norms or customary law, these are considered the most important rights and ones which states cannot ignore or change or deny. They include the right to life, freedom from torture and slavery, and freedom from discrimination. This rise exists 
regardless if a state recognizes them or not. A state can't claim these rights do not exist in their territory, nor can they change their definition of these rights to avoid recognizing them. For example, changing the definition of slavery or torture to legalize it. These are second to six articles of the UDHR. The next group of rights are those which ensure that the rule of law exists in all countries. Rule of law means that people can get justice because they can access the courts and they are treated equally and fairly by the court system. Examples of these rights include right to a fair trial, everyone is equal before the law, people cannot be arbitrarily arrested and detained, and people are innocent until proven guilty. These rights are found in the UDHR from Article 7 to 11. The next category are called civil rights, and these are rights to ensure society functions in a civil way. These are right to privacy, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, the right to marry, and the right to citizenship. Civil rights ensure that people can live peacefully in society and their lives are not interfered with by others or by the government. They are found in the UDHR Article 12 to 19. The next set of rights are called political rights, and these are rights ensuring people can participate in the politics of a country through their right to vote and the right to elect representatives. Political rights also include the right to assemble or meet together in public, like when people are either protesting or celebrating something. The right to form a group is also a political right, known as the right to association, when people can form any group whether it is a political group, a fan club, or a sports team. Many people consider their freedom of expression is both a political right and a civil right. Political rights are Articles 20 and 21 in the UDHR. Next category is economic rights. These are the rights that ensure someone can earn a living. Economic rights are mainly the right to work and a person's rights in the workplace. They also cover the right to have holidays from work or the right to leisure. Economic rights also include the right to welfare if a person is unable to earn money for themselves, say if they are disabled or aged, and cannot work. Economic rights are Articles 22 to 24 of the UDHR. Social rights are the rights for people to have government social services like education, health, food, water, and housing. Every government around the world should have an education system and hospitals. These services should be free for people who cannot afford them. Social rights also cover a person's right to food, water, and housing. While it is acknowledged that everyone is responsible for getting their own food, water, and housing, in some situations the government should help people if they cannot get them themselves. For example, if there is a disaster, the government should feed and house people till they can get their own food and shelter. Social rights are Articles 25 and 26 of the UDHR. Lastly, we have cultural rights. This right gives people the freedom to practice their culture. Here, culture is defined as a people's language, religion, and cultural practices. There is a lot of debate about the meaning of this right and what parts of culture are protected. Culture could mean to some people the right to listen to pop music and watch television. That could mean the right to speak an indigenous language to others. The purpose of these categories is not to rank some rights as more important than the others. Rather, it is to show some common features. For example, all social rights involve some kind of government service, whether it is to provide education, health, or food, whereas civil rights are mainly about individual freedom, such as freedom to move, expression, be religious, and have a private life. The categories are not independent from each other because human rights are said to be indivisible, interrelated, and interdependent. Indivisible means that a government cannot divide up rights and choose some categories but not others. A government must take human rights as a whole and protect their rights in all categories. Interdependent and interrelated mean that each category of rights is linked to the other categories. For example, the right to education, a social right, 
depends on freedom of movement to reach school, a civil right. But movement depends on having enough money, say, for a bus ticket, an economic right. But to ride the bus, one needs to be healthy, a social right. But being healthy may depend on demanding a government that ensures people's rights to health care, a political right. The UDHR is an important document in human rights because it is internationally agreed standard of what are human rights. All countries in the world agree that human rights are defined by the UDHR, making it a very important document. Let's hear some expert views of the importance of the UDHR to Southeast Asia. So the UDHR is particularly important in the region because it is universal. Uh, so unlike treaties where you have the question of ratification and state party uh, status, the Universal Declaration applies everywhere and anyone can use it. And so civil society in the region can turn to the UDHR as a sort of uh, when, when all else fails. You can turn, you know, turning to that document and saying, look, these are the rules, these are the expectations, and these are things that we can demand. The Universal of Declaration of the Human Rights is the source of the human rights treaties. Uh, even though the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights is not a bright the states as the international law, but the states in Southeast Asian countries or ASEAN countries uh, are the members of the United Nations. They uh, have moral obligation to respect uh, the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights. Since the Universal Declaration in 1948, human rights have evolved and developed over that time. The Declaration has turned into what's called a treaty. Now the important thing is that treaties are different because treaties are legally binding. That states voluntarily agree to these treaties to make treaties law in that country. So since 1948 we've seen nine human rights treaties. And these treaties have developed human rights in terms of areas of protection of people, such as protection of women and children and disabled people and migrant workers. We've also seen human rights define various crimes and limit the power of states in terms of areas such as racial discrimination, torture and disappearances. Now, in all these cases, states voluntarily agree to introduce these laws to protect the people and to introduce various duties that states have towards these people. So now let's turn to look at these nine treaties and what are some of the rights in these treaties. We are going to briefly look over the nine human rights treaties which have become international law since the foundation of the United Nations. There are many other treaties which have human rights in them. For example, the Refugee Convention, Genocide Convention, or Regional Human Rights Convention. These be covered in separate classes. The first convention is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It is known as ICERD. It was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1965. This convention is aimed at eliminating racism. It protects people from being discriminated against because of the color of their skin or their ethnicity. When it appeared in the 1960s, there was a lot of racism in the world. Countries like Australia, United States, and South Africa had laws which took away rights from people based on their race. For example, the indigenous Australians were not allowed to vote, among many other rights that were denied. And South Africa's apartheid system took away rights in almost every area of life for non-white South Africans. The second treaty is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. This was adopted in 1966. It is commonly called the ICESCR. The treaty is mainly made up from rights found in the UDHR. Articles 23 to 27. As the name implies, the covenant covers economic rights, like the right to work, social rights, like health and education, and cultural rights. All but four Southeast Asian countries have agreed to this treaty. There is an optional protocol to this treaty. An optional protocol is an additional treaty which adds something to the original treaty. The ICSCR optional protocol adds a complaint mechanism. This is where people can complain to the UN if their rights are violated. They are optional for states, and as yet, no country in Southeast Asia has agreed to this protocol.
The next treaty is International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or ICCPR. Like the ICSCR, it comes from the UDHR, in particular Articles 2-21, to covering fundamental rights, rights in the court, civil rights, and political rights. Like the ICSCR, it is known as a covenant, and not a convention like the rest of the human rights treaties. A covenant implies this is an important treaty, but there is nothing different legally about a covenant from other treaties. Important rights in the ITCPR include freedom of expression, the limitations on the use of the death penalty, and rights to a fair trial. There are two optional protocols. One is where states agree to a complaint mechanism, and the second is an abolition of a death penalty. There are still four countries yet to agree to this treaty in Southeast Asia. The next is a convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, or known as CEDA. It appeared in 1979, after over a decade of advocacy for women's human rights. CEDA aims to eliminate discrimination against women by outlining areas where women should receive equal treatment, such as in the workplace, in education, in politics, and in law. When CEDA appeared, it was still possible for a government to have laws which allowed women to be paid less or not given the same legal rights as men to own land or get a divorce. While the convention has not stopped this, there have been significant improvements in women's rights in the past decades. CEDA has an optional protocol on individual complaints mechanism. Every country in the Southeast Asia has agreed to CEDA. CEDA is discussed more in class three of the Human Rights Course. The next convention to appear was a Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, or known as CAT. CAT is a response to the many countries in the 1970s that practiced torture against political opponents, in particular Latin American countries like Argentina and Chile. Torture is where someone is put under severe pain and suffering for a reason, like to confess to a crime or as punishment for something they have done. CAT makes torture a crime and enables torturers to be extradited to face justice. In Southeast Asia, torture still continues in some police stations or it is conducted against political opponents. There is an optional protocol that establishes a system of regular visits by independent experts to places of detention like jails or army bases. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, or known as the CRC, is the most widely supported treaty with all but one country in the world agreeing to it. The CRC ensures children have rights like any other human, like freedom of expression, rights to move, and rights to education. It also protects them from violence and other violations like child labor. Every country in Southeast Asia has agreed to CRC. There are three optional protocols. A protocol on stopping child soldiers, a protocol to stop the sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography, and an individual complaints procedure. The CRC is discussed more in Class 4 of the Human Rights Course. The International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families, or the Migrant Workers Convention, is the least ratified convention. Only two countries in Southeast Asia have agreed to it. The Migrant Workers Convention gives protection to all migrant workers, whether they are legally in a country or not. It also gives some rights to their family members. Given there are millions of migrant workers in Southeast Asia, and millions of Southeast Asians are migrant workers around the world, it is a very important but not widely accepted treaty. The treaty mainly ensures that existing human rights also cover migrant workers. But it does add some rights specific to migrant workers, including freedom from expulsion from a country, safe workplaces, consular assistance, and protecting worker ID cards. This convention is discussed more in Class 10. The next treaty is a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, also known as CRPD. It was adopted in 2006. The convention represents a paradigm shift in defining disability 
and how people with a disability should be treated by society. Rather than see a disability as a problem with a person, the convention sees disability as a barrier's place in society stopping people from getting their rights. It recognizes persons with disabilities as holders of human rights who are entitled to actively participate in decision-making that impacts upon their lives. Some rights in this convention include rights to participate, to be free from discrimination, and rights to health, education, and work. It contains one optional protocol on receiving complaints from individuals or groups of persons. Every country in Southeast Asia has agreed to this convention. Forced disappearance was adopted in 2006. A disappearance is where someone is taken by the state and disappears while in custody. Sometimes this is because they are illegally held and they ask questions. Other times it is because they are murdered and their body is hidden. Or sometimes it could be a mistake of not recording that the person is in jail. This convention provides a definition of enforced disappearance and then details what a state should do to address the crime of enforced disappearance. The convention also recognizes the rights of victims and their families to know the truth regarding the circumstances of the disappeared person. In Southeast Asia, only one country has agreed to this treaty. So these are the nine core human rights treaties. The total number of treaties, including the optional protocols, is 18. Nine treaties and nine optional protocols. But remember, and many other treaties also include human rights. Most of these treaties are discussed in other classes. So the rights of women, children, people with disability, and migrant workers all have classes in them. Last, the dates given when they appeared at the UN, which is called being adopted. However, when they became law, or what is known as coming into force, is different, as this is often years later. We will look at the ratification of treaties in Southeast Asia first, before discussing what adoption, ratification, and into force means next. Now, for human rights, it means that states volunteer to agree to these rights. They volunteer to respect them, and in some ways they volunteer to extra duties to ensure that people get those rights. Now, what's interesting about the human rights treaties is that most treaties have been ratified by most countries in the world. Some treaties have near universal ratification, like the Rights of Children and the Women's Rights Convention. We're talking about all but a handful of countries have ratified those. Most other treaties have like 150 or 160 countries around the world have recognised them. So we're not talking about a, a fringe area of law, we're talking about a law which most countries agree. Now turning to Southeast Asia, some countries have quite a good record of ratifying nearly all the human rights treaties. So when does a human rights treaty become law? This demands understanding, firstly, who decides when a human rights treaty should be introduced? It is often made by coalitions of states, organizations, and individuals who lobby at the UN for the introduction of a new treaty. For example, many countries, women's organizations, and people believe there should be human rights for women, and so CEDA was introduced. When enough states agree a treaty can be drafted and adopted by the UN General Assembly. The first step is adoption, where the UN, in particular the General Assembly, votes to accept the treaty. They are basically accepting that this treaty can become international law. Secondly, individual countries volunteer to make a treaty law in their country. They do this by firstly signing it at the UN, which means they are starting the process to making it law. The treaty is passed as law by the national government in the process known as ratification. The state must complete its own national legislative requirements, which may include getting approval from national bodies and changing existing laws which contradict the treaty. At this stage, a government may make reservations to a treaty. A reservation is where a right in the treaty may be put aside, so the right is reserved, with the intention the government will agree to it at a later date. Once this is done, the country then sends an official letter called Instrument of Ratification containing the decision of ratification to the United Nations Secretary General in New York. However, treaties do not come into action once a single country has signed it. 
treaties need more than one state ratification. However, the number of ratifications for a treaty varies. For example, the ITCPR and the ICSCR required 35 state parties, whereas CRC, CAT, and People with Disabilities only needed 20. Once into force, it means this treaty is now legally binding to all states which have ratified it. Let's now look at what treaties have been ratified in Southeast Asia. We are going to look at the ratification of treaties by Southeast Asia countries. Firstly, let's look at what treaties get ratified. The most ratified treaty are the Convention on Women's Rights, CDR, and the Children's Rights Convention, CRC, which all Southeast Asia countries have ratified. The next is the Convention for Persons with a Disability, and every country but East Timor has ratified this convention. The least ratified treaty is the Convention on Enforced Disappearances, which only has one ratification by Cambodia. Let's now look at which countries have ratified the most treaties. In Southeast Asia, three countries have ratified eight of the nine treaties. These countries are Cambodia, Philippines, and Indonesia. There are four countries which have ratified only three of the nine treaties, which is the lowest amount in Southeast Asia. These countries are Singapore, Malaysia, Myanmar, and Brunei. Finally, let's look at when the treaties were ratified. The first human rights treaty ratified in Southeast Asia was when the Philippines ratified the Treaty Against Racial Discrimination in 1967. The most recent is when Brunei ratified the Convention on People with a Disability last year in 2016. So what we've covered in this class is we've looked at some of the main concepts and the fundamental ideas of human rights. We've talked a bit about some important documents like the Universal Declaration and the nine treaties. But an important thing is that all these treaties, they give various rights. We know that around the world, people's human rights are still violated. Every country in the world still has problems about human rights. So the issue is not so much about we have what we call standards or those rights that exist. An important part of that is that how do we protect those rights? What are the peoples and the bodies and the institutions who ensure that human rights are protected? And that'll be the subject of the next class.